Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here in New York City at Fifth Cloud Expo. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're following this general session out there on the World Wide Web via Syscon TV. I hope you brought your brain this morning when you came to the Jacob Javits Center, because this next session is going to test whether that's the case or not. We have Marty Govan coming next, all the way from Australia, and... Uh, just listen up. I'm not going to say any more. Look at the title of this, Third Generation Outsourcing, and try and think what on earth that could be before he reaches this podium. Good luck with it. Marty, take it away, sir. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's interesting to th look at what we've been doing here today and yesterday and tomorrow and talking about the cloud, how the cloud works, what the cloud can do. I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle and look at it from the point of view of what's a, what's a system, what's, a, what's a, a way of operating that exists in the world today that the cloud pretty much turns on its head. And that is the, the concept of outsourcing. Now, before I actually get into the detail of what outsourcing is and the evolution and the history of outsourcing, there is one small piece of terminology that I'd like to clarify. Obviously, lots of people have been talking about IAS, PaaS, SAS, and so forth. I think the really interesting part of all those acronyms is the AS part. What does as a service mean? And to me, as a service means something that I can call upon whenever I want to. As a service means like the telephone network, like turning on the electricity, like hailing a cab. And so it's in that context that the service part of what I'm talking about should be considered. Now, my background is that I have started and run a variety of companies over the years. Particularly, I've been involved in the various generations of outsourcing, which I'll talk about in a moment. Parsec, Hostworks, and, and now Virtual Arc have existed across that spectrum. And so it gives me an interesting context to be able to talk to you today about the way in which evolution has evolved, and more importantly, the way in which it can now evolve with the introduction of the cloud. Now, the central idea behind outsourcing is that an enterprise should focus upon what it does best. Uh, and hire somebody else to do the rest of the stuff. Um, make steel, generate electricity, and so on and so forth. Um, just now that people are, are, are gathering in the room, how many of you outsource today? Anything? And the rest of you mow your own lawn? Make your own coffee? One of, one of the things I've, I find really pretty interesting is the way in which outsourcing sort of underpins a lot of our modern society and culture. And in particular, as the slide says, that businesses should outsource what, they, what is the same about them and not outsource what differentiates them. Now, before I, before I get off that point of, of differentiation, how many people here think that their data center is a key differentiator. The actual way their data center is put together, the way, the way it's built, its location on the planet, actually makes them a, a, able to compete better than anybody else. I don't expect very many hands here because this is a cloud conference, which is kind of the flip side. But it is one of the challenges that, that I guess IT has faced in terms of how that kind of shift away from the physical infrastructure has proceeded. The first generation of outsourcing came about, of IT outsourcing came about in the 80s. And I guess the, the common phrase for it is your mess for less. This was about taking your people and your tin, shipping it off to somebody else, and then bringing it back in as OPEX. It means that if you, if you actually went and, and rang IT support or, or got in touch with any of your developers, you were actually talking to the same people again, but they were working for someone else. Um, as such, it was largely a finance exercise and didn't necessarily produce much of a benefit in IP. But as I said there, it produced some, some 
key drivers because running a huge mainframe data center was not a differentiator. And the main benefit that the outsourcers gained from was economies of scale. It was easy to implement because it was just the whole thing. Take all of my IT, don't change it, but just take it away. And it gave you one throat to choke, one, one organization to go back to if things weren't working the way that you wanted. On the downside, there was a lack of value add. As I said, the, the outsourcer didn't have to add any IP. And because of the, the way the economy, economics worked, you ended up with very long contracts that um, gave very little flexibility. The second generation, to use the terms invented by, by Gartner and IDC, was selective sourcing, strategic sourcing, or multi-sourcing. This treats a given function such as IT as a portfolio of activities, some of which should be outsourced and some of which shouldn't. So for example, selective sourcing meant that you could keep your, your software development in-house if that was a differentiator for your organization, but you could send the help desk or the PC support or the mainframe to organizations that were specialized in those areas. It moves away from the idea that IT is a commodity. Now, <clears throat> this means that you can put packages of work with specialist providers who actually have the IP, who do this service for a bunch of other folks, and that gives you then some significant advantages. And you're also now down to a three to five year term. And this selective sourcing model is what pervades the industry at the moment. The downside is you end up with complex relationships. You have lots of people that you're outsourcing to. It's difficult to avoid finger pointing as the boundaries between different outsources are, are hard to define. And a big negative is it's got a three to five year term. If you look at the way that IT is outsourced compared to other things, why should you have to contract your IT for a three to five year term? Now the second generation of outsourcing has evolved considerably. We now have a situation where uh, licensing models have, have evolved. So we have SaaS. You can buy your software, you can rent your software on a month by month basis. We have flexible infrastructure, utility computing, grid computing, ultimately cloud computing. And we have web-based application delivery. So the, uh, the whole idea of your own private network and so forth has become less significant. In Virtual Arc, we call this 2G SaaS. This at salesforce.com is the most referenced example. So this is a CRM service that you can get. It's best of breed. You can customize it to your, to your heart's desire. And it's a service that is offered to you over the internet. Any of your staff can access this from anywhere. They're all, that's all fantastic. The downside is that typically you'll be signing up for a two-year contract. You'll be signing up for a fixed number of seats and you'll have a large implementation cost. And that's what we mean about, it's still, it's SaaS, but it still has lots of the hairs on it that the outsourcing model has had for the last 20 years. So as, as I've been saying, problems remain. Outsourcing is still rigid. The contract term, the service levels, and the charging models are locked in. If you want, if you have a situation where you say, look, I've, I've got a retailing system but I do 60% of my business, you know, anybody here sell chocolate? Don't know what the situation is here in the, here in the States, but certainly in Australia, 60% of everyone, of any business that sells chocolate, 60% of their business is done in the six weeks before Easter. So if they've got a, if you've got a retail system and you outsource it and you make chocolate, you're going to be paying the same every month despite the fact that you do 60% of your business in six weeks. It also means from a service level perspective, if, you'd like, if you say, look, I'd like 99.9% .9 availability. One of our clients is a ticketing organization. 99.9% .9 availability is 44 minutes of downtime a month. When they put the, the, um, the sales for the next pink tour on, on, the, on their site, if they had 44 minutes of downtime, that would ruin them in one go. 44 minutes, bankrupt. Yet 99.9% .9 availability, you go, that's pretty good, isn't it? So service levels need to vary to meet the, the, the business requirements of the modern organization. And we've still got cost structures that remain fundamentally unchanged. 
the reason why you are locked into a three to five year contract term, really oddly, seems to be because that's about how long a server can be made to last. Who cares? Yet that's the way outsourcing works. So, and then as I say there, you end up with these upgrades at anniversary points which are difficult. So let's now look at where we can go from here. Gartner um, surveyed a range of CIOs going back eight, nine months ago. Steps to the GFC, what, is, what, do you, what do you want? What are you seeking? And so the view became that we want to reduce IT complexity and cost. We want to make more of the IT budget variable. And we want to make a tangible difference to the business. I mean, the last point's obvious, isn't it? If you don't make a tangible difference to the to the, uh, to the business, when you're talking to the CEO or the board, they're going to cut your budget. And so this is where we started to think about, well, how can we change the outsourcing model that I and my team have been working in for a long, long time based on the way the cloud works? So the key elements of third generation outsourcing from our perspective are that you have no infrastructure. You as the customer don't have any infrastructure, obviously, but the outsourcer doesn't have any infrastructure either. The second is that it, you op it operates on a pay-as-you-use basis. The third is that the service levels are tied to the outsourcer. So there's no excuses. There's no, oh, yeah, but the data center didn't work or the network failed or something like that. Everything comes together with the outsourcer. And finally, if you want to, you don't have to have a term. It's like, I'd like to outsource this for a day. So let's look at those four elements of the third generation outsourcing in a little bit more detail. So when we say no infrastructure, obviously we're at the Cloud Expo. What we're talking about is moving everything to the cloud. And because this is about no infrastructure, public cloud is the ideal, it's the epitome of third generation outsourcing. The model works with private clouds and with hybrid clouds as well, but it's a little bit less pure. The infrastructure is commoditized and homogenized. We don't have different infrastructure for different applications. That's once again implicit in the cloud model. Obsolescence is eliminated, and the influence of geography is minimized. One of our other customers is, a, is an airline. And one of the things that they came to us about was they said, look, we actually want to be able to enter a new market in two weeks. Not two weeks from now, but any two weeks. So if we want to identify a new airport we want to fly into, two weeks, that's the start point. And they'd actually come up with the two weeks because that what they believed was what going flat out would require for the IT. So this, this involved 22 applications being deployed into the new airport, getting in the, you know, the, the routers and the network connectivity and the PCs and so forth. Um, what we've actually found as we've rolled out their environment is that the IT component, using third generation outsourcing principles, takes a day and a half. So they, they can then use the rest of their two weeks to hire the staff and train them and so on and so forth. And this is all about minimizing geography because it doesn't really matter where you're moving to in a cloud-based environment. We then have pay-as-you-use. Now, pay-as-you-use, that's what everybody's here for, right? The cloud gives you the flexibility to opt in, opt out. 10 VMs, 40 hours each, 100 gig of storage for the month, off we go. As an infrastructure piece, that's all very well. But the infrastructure in a typical outsourcing total cost of ownership for an, an IT application, the infrastructure is a tiny piece. The next piece is the application itself. Well, that's where SaaS kicks in. SaaS is about taking that, that application and moving it into some sort of a, whether it's a fee per month, fee per hour, fee per transaction kind of a model, or some other way in which we tie back into the usage of the, of the application itself. One of the models that's particularly attractive in this context is where you can tie it to the way in which the, you create value. So if, if being able to serve concurrent users is what matters, then bill on concurrent users. If processing transactions or orders or invoices is what matters, bill on that. Then the third piece, which is most important to third generation outsourcing, is to take the services component, the people costs of the outsourcer, and bill those on a usage basis. These are the fees which outsourcers absolutely cream you on if, they, if you're an outsourcing customer. Because with, they'll, they'll 
base your fee on your busiest month and you'll, you'll be paying for it from then on. The shift here in third generation outsourcing is to say, well, there is really no justification for that. Produce a variable charging model for the way in which people are billed, the services are billed, and you can then align the total cost of the IT budget with the, with the focus of the business on creating value. Now, the service level is tied to the outsourcer. I mentioned earlier that second generation outsourcing involves a fair amount of finger pointing. The foundations of the service need to be able to be configured to achieve the service outcome. What I mean by that is, if you are working with a cloud provider at the moment, then you're tied to their understanding of service. And let's, let's face it, service levels are one of the fundamental problems of public clouds at this point in time. Most public clouds offer service levels that are unacceptable to enterprise customers. But if we look at that in the abstract and say, well, what could we build out of public clouds? And the term that you may have heard from the talks of one of my colleagues is that the term redundant array of independent clouds. If we deploy your application on multiple clouds, then we can actually construct a service level which is higher than that of the individual clouds. And this applies to all service levels, not just availability, but also performance and so forth. And so this means that we can, the buck stops with us, the buck stops with the third generation outsourcer, rather than being passed down through the chain to people you've never met before. We can also deliver cost efficiencies through being a cloud broker. Now, there's an example there on the screen of the sort of parameters you might get amongst three clouds. None of them is ideal. All of them have got features that are handy. So why not use all three of them, but vary their use based upon the application, based upon the workload, based upon the time of the day, time of the year, geography of the end user, and so be able to optimize your service based around those parameters and your, the needs of your business. That's the function of a cloud broker, and that's part of the third generation outsourcing model. And the idea of having no term, this is the one that to anybody who's in the outsourcing business absolutely sends a shiver up your spine. But it's extremely important because as I say, historically, contract terms have been controlled and the sort of excuse has been the life of the infrastructure. What we can do instead is balance, use term as a way of balancing price and risk between the, con the, the outsourcer and the customer. And in a moment when I talk about price, you'll be able to see some of the effect of that. Now, this is a complex slide, but I think gives us some kind of an idea of what's going on between these various models. It summarizes what I'm talking about. And these slides will be available to download, so don't try and squint and focus too much on the text. On the left-hand side, we have a list of the enterprise requirements. So reduced vendor management, reduced infrastructure costs, improved service levels, performance improvements, and then the extent to which various models, the outsourcing models I've spoken about and some other intermediate ones, address those. And as we move from the left to the right across the screen, we get closer towards now, closer towards the kinds of features that we're seeking. It's interesting that the cloud by itself is actually the second red column. So the cloud by itself actually addresses very few of the requirements of the enterprise, and that's because it is largely an infrastructure service. Generation one and generation two outsourcing address more of those components, but as you can see, the nice thing about it is generation two outsourcing and the cloud, the features that they provide actually complement each other. That's why we see the shift to third generation outsourcing as being one that is fundamental and one that is only possible to do now as the maturity of the cloud allows us to. And so we get to the third generation outsourcing bar on the right hand side of the screen which ticks all the boxes. Now, we talk, I talked a little bit earlier about second generation SaaS and the way that salesforce.com operates. We have a view that there is, as a result of this shift in the outsourcing model, an opportunity also to move towards third generation SaaS, 3G SaaS. SaaS has been defined by, by the, the Gartners and so forth of the world as being multi-tenant. But in a virtualized world, multi-tenancy is no longer mandatory. It's no longer a requirement of the way in which SaaS works. And in fact, 
there's a continuum between a dedicated instance and multi-tenancy. What, what we mean by that is that every layer of your application, be it up from the infrastructure to the network to the database to the application layer to the web services or, or, or presentation layer, can operate differently between multi-tenant and single tenant, uh, a dedicated instance, as, as you require. The point here is that multi-tenanted layers are high value. They produce very, very positive impacts on, on the cost model. But, but you're locked in. Everybody in a multi-tenanted environment is upgraded at the same time. Everybody has their patches applied at the same time. Everybody has their downtime at the same time. And for your application layer, for your, for your business logic, that might be completely inappropriate. And so you put that in a dedicated instance environment. And so this is where complex applications and large enterprises can be accommodated better. It also means that scale works independently across each of those layers. So we can scale out each of those layers in different ways as the requirements of the application, the business logic, and the users require. And finally, the distribution of the various layers of SaaS, the various layers of the application stack, geographically, can be improved to enhance the way in which your, your end user experience needs to work. So you might say, look, I really want my data to live here in mainland US. I want my data to live where I, it, is, it is closer to my point of control. But the, you might then say, well, my business logic is actually ephemeral. I actually want to, to be able to deploy my application layers across all of the occupied continents. And my web servers, I actually want them to go right the way out to the edge. I want to deploy them in my 50 largest markets. Within this model, you've got the flexibility to do that. Now, you might be saying, well, yeah, but what applications can actually work like this? The compatibility question is one that has certainly been fundamental to us. But we've found that we can actually take the tools and the framework and the platform that we've configured for this and deploy it with a very wide range of applications. The access method doesn't particularly matter. The architecture doesn't particularly matter. The things like the brand of database and so on and so forth don't particularly matter in terms of the technology. In terms of licensing, absolutely makes a difference. And we have various paths that we, we would always encourage customers and, and indeed ISVs and industries to go down in that context. But the technology exists to overcome those problems from, from a pure technology perspective. Now, Virtual Arc's own experience, I think, is is instructive. Um, as I say there, we eat our own dog food. How many people here have sought to run a virtual organization? What I mean by that is we, we, have, we operate an organization where anybody who joins our company receives a backpack. That backpack contains everything that they need, not only for Whatever, wherever they happen to be, whatever airport lounge or Starbucks or their home or, or their office, for that to be their office, they can, it contains everything for that place to be our head office. Answering the phones, responding to emails, faxes, engaging with any of the applications that we deploy, the obvious basis being that they're all on the cloud. One of the missions I set myself in this business, being sort of the fourth one that I've started, is I never wanted to own a server. And I see there's really no basis for me needing to as we move forward. Now, let's look at it from the point of view of four different groups of people who may all be represented here in this room. 3G, 3G outsourcing, you know, what does it mean? Well, if you're a CIO, then what it does is it actually reduces a whole lot of risks. A whole lot of the things that keep you awake at night go away. The application choice question really is massively diminished because you're no longer saying, well, whatever application I pick, I'm stuck with for three years, five years, whatever. My service provider, similarly, I'm not stuck with them. I can, I can choose whatever pricing model I want. I can say, look, I'd like to actually outsource this, this application for three months, for starters. If that works, we can then move to a longer term. And it also may, may, means that your, your pricing, your competitiveness and so forth has improved. How many, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced the effect of, of signing up to an outsourcing agreement believing that it's a really good deal. 
and then three, four years in, getting called into the CEO's office and going, why are we paying twice the market rate for this stuff? This is one of the effects of, of typical outsourcing, which can now be overcome, because you can, be, you can choose your term to be responsive to the market. And you can be more responsive to your internal customers in terms of time to market around applications and so forth. From the point of view of the CEO, one of the big advantages you see is time to market. I mentioned that airline example. This is the, the ability of this airline to get their IT deployed into a new market in a day and a half, that's down from eight months two years ago. So this is a, a, a tremendous shift into the, the ability of an organisation to be competitive and to respond. Also, as I said before, the pricing model means there's cost alignment to value creation. We don't need long-term commitment. And more importantly, IT adds real value to the business. It's not a cost centre. Now, if you're an ISV, you know, you've written software, you've got your, your customers, you're winning business, why should you do this? And certainly what we find is that ISVs are really our first, our first hurdle because ISVs have the most questions. It's like, well, I've all organised all the remuneration plans for my salespeople. Now you want, now you want to shift to, to no fixed term and no, no capex, and how am I ever going to pay, pay commissions? You're also shifting, shifting me to a, a model where all of the sophistication I've built into my pricing model has gone away. One of the things we find with ISVs, though, is sophistication in pricing models when you look at it from the customer side, is complexity in pricing models. Hands up everyone who'd like more complexity. So what it means instead is that the ISVs have the opportunity to move to new scale points. So suddenly a product that you've written to design for the 100 seat company can move more easily to the 1,000 seat company or the 10 seat company. It also means you can move more easily to new geographies. You don't need to say, well, yeah, I'm going to have to establish a whole lot of new infrastructure, new capability in this, new, this next geography I want to pursue. If you want to start running, things in, start running things in Europe, not even a volcano will stop you from being able to do that. And it also means that your SaaS delivery can actually leapfrog some of the bigger threats. And th some of the bigger threats for most ISVs are around 2G SaaS deployments. Every CRM vendor in the world quakes in the boots when you talk about salesforce.com. Yet this model actually allows you to overcome some of the remaining outsourcing related constraints of that kind of model. Incidentally, I'm not trying to bag salesforce.com. They're a great company. Um, now, as a service provider, you'd sort of think, well, the people who are providing the outsourcing, sure, that they're the guys who lose out in this new model. But it, instead, what happens is that through having greater flexibility, you have a much greater ability to ring, win new business. Those of you who didn't put up your hands earlier on in this talk about whether you're outsourced, then become the target customers for the service providers. As I say, you can span geographies transparently. You don't need to think, well, yeah, I'm an outsourcer that operates in North America. It's like I'm an outsourcer that operates anywhere. And in particular, you can drive to your strengths even more. So one of the problems in the service provider industry is if you're, an, if you're a, 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 an IT service provider in Denver, you think, well, I have to win all the business in Denver. Whereas what you're actually good at is providing security services. So now you can provide security services anywhere rather than trying to compete in the areas you're not good at. So, but not is all, not everything is entirely rosy. There are still challenges and risks associated with moving to this new model. So can I get the applications I want delivered in this way? One of the first the starting points for you is to go back to your application vendor and press for this kind of change to take place. Introduce them to us, if you like. Have you got the processes to deal with totally variable charging? Um, this is a really interesting one, and one that can be very frightening for enterprises when they realise that it's like having um, it's like giving everybody mobile phones without having a fixed plan. It's like, but I could have a guy who suddenly spends two or $3,000 in a month on mobile phone calls. Um, you need the processes to be able to handle that 
put in place caps, put in place controls in terms of the way, as, way usage is working. And flowing on from that, how is billing and metering data going to be gathered? You do need a central point for that. And will my application operate securely on the cloud? Some of you, I'm sure, have been along to the security sessions. Um, we certainly have some, uh, some strong views on that, and that those slides will be available on the, the website. Now, I mentioned <coughs> pricing before. Looking at pricing in a little bit more detail, and the fact that you, it's a, everything's a trade-off. It's flexible, distributing risk, and price. So price changes with the term you choose, price changes with the service level you choose, price changes with the flexibility that you would prefer. The interesting thing is that the traditional selective sourcing models only allowed you op to operate in a very narrow ranges of those pricing curves. So instead of choosing a three to five year term, you can have a one month term. Instead of choosing between 99.8 and 99.9% .9 service levels, you can have 99.999 if you'd like, or 95 or switch between them and between weekdays and weekends. And the ability to increase your flexibility across multiple clouds, multiple geographies and so forth, as I said, is quite significant. But the headline, 40% cheaper than equivalent second generation outsourcing. And this is because you're not paying for the capacity, you're not paying for the usage that you don't, that you don't get benefit from. So what do we do? Virtual Arc provides SaaS enablement of Fortune 1000 enterprise applications on existing clouds. And we deliver the, that as a managed service to end customers with consumption-based pricing. In essence, third generation outsourcing of enterprise applications. So we work with the ISVs to enable their applications for 3G SaaS and We're providing the third generation outsourcing and cloud brokerage service for these applications. Now, a couple of conclusion slides here. Third generation outsourcing is a natural consequence of the way in which the cloud delivers infrastructure. And the key elements are no infrastructure, pay as you use, the buck stops with the outsourcer, and you can trade off flexibility and price. Third generation software as a service, 3G SaaS, builds upon the outsourcing to provide a complete managed service in which all the elements are pay as you use. And so, as a takeaway, outsourcing plus the cloud can deliver new capabilities. We've moved from first generation outsourcing, big and dumb, to second generation outsourcing, small but rigid. Now we have the opportunity for third generation outsourcing, which is flexible and responsive, and actually not only allows you to, to tweak individual details, but actually enables you to shrink your costs and expand them again as your, as your needs require. So thank you for your time. I have, I think, a few minutes in which I can take some questions. Yes, sir. The interesting thing that we find is that it doesn't actually come out of the ISVs. The ISVs that we've migrated in this fashion have not seen a decrease in their fees per customer per year. They've actually seen an increase. What's shifted is not the price, but the risk. So they risk on a given customer making less money. They also risk making more money. And that's, that becomes the balancing point, and that becomes the, the pricing exercise in terms of where you actually set that price. The advantage is the customer that's paying you more is gaining more value, so they're happier. The customer that's paying you less is gaining less value, so they're not bitching at you about the price. Other questions? 
Thank you very much for your time.